and Vietnam from 1967, 1968, which of course, uh, great uh, for, for me, uh, being the Marine uh, veteran, and always have my Navy Corpsman that really uh, did lead the way, so I always appreciate that. Um, he and his team continue to brave, uh, blaze new trails in genomics, and they have sequenced and analyzed hundreds of genomes, and have published numerous important papers covering such areas as environmental genomics, the first complete diploid human genome, and the groundbreaking advance in creating the first cell, replicating bacterial cell, constructed entirely of synthetic DNA. That is a mouthful. Um, one of the most frequently cited scientists and the author of more than 280 <laughs> research articles, also the recipient wow. of numerous honorary degrees, public honors, and scientific awards. Dr. Venter, thank you very much for being with us this morning. <laughs> It is a mouthful. Um, RJ Kelly, founder and chief visionary of the Wealth Legacy Family of Companies, headquartered here in San Diego, California, um, specializing in helping closely held business and professional families with the growth management protection, distribution, legacy issues of their wealth. His interests include a commitment to being a wise and fun husband. I hope he's wise and fun, Vimian. And, and being an active community church and international volunteer work. He's blessed to be married to his wife, Vimian. Again, one of the uh, awesome folks who have been helping us to put this together, who helps out greatly in this group. Um, so, gentlemen, the floor is yours. And really do, again, please take the time to listen. So, thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Phil. And I tell you what, we would not be here this morning without the, obviously, our financial support. Um, and our volunteers, uh, in fact, I've been asked a number of times by people who just think that we do, our nonprofit is all we do. <laughs> it's like, no, um, as my wife reminds me, the best thing we can do for the poor is not be one of them. <laughs> so, um, so we have a for-profit side. I also want to acknowledge my dear friend, Alan Niven, Alan and I, Terry Moore, and another friend, Bill Exeter, who, uh, nine years ago thought we would meet together, uh, put together one seminar, to bring cutting edge, what we call hot topics for business owners. You know, little did we know that one seminar would now be nine years later, we've done over 40 in San Diego and five in Las Vegas. So, you know, it's a wild ride, but what it has morphed into is the opportunity to be around folks that are truly impacting the world in a lasting positive way. So we just, as Phil just mentioned, we, we finished our inspirational word event. In, by the way, in your programs, you'll see dates for our upcoming breakfast and our next inspirational word event. But um, the, the, what is the opportunity that we have is to be in front of people that are truly groundbreaking. Now, Craig is one of those people. As Phil said, not only is he considered one of the leading genomic scientists in the world, but he has also been credited by some as being one of the leading scientists of all time. Let your brain wrap around that one for a second. Uh, now, he's not without his critics. There are a few, probably two or three, that have been a bit critical of some of the things that you're going to hear about as we chat. It's actually four. Four. Okay, that's right. <laughs> I remember it was on one hand. Um, I want you to also understand that two days ago, uh, I was chatting with, he, there's the story of Pavarotti, the world famous tenor. And Pavarotti, a group of men were, were getting together and they were fighting and arguing about each other. What made Pavarotti great? They said, well, Pavarotti has the best advanced team in the world. And I got to say, Craig has the best advanced team in the world. We can, Tim and Charles and Michelle. And now we've got Jill here as well, who's one of the vice presidents as well. And another friend said, no, it's they've got the best um, sound people in the world. They, they produce it. And then another one said, no, 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 no. They have the best organization behind them. But then the fourth guy leans back and says, you know what? Sooner or later, Pavarotti has to sing. <laughs> So we have Pavarotti this morning. Don't want me to say. <laughs> now, if I can just get my document back, there it is. Okay. So I um, also want to let you in on a secret. When I do my interviews, I spend usually 10 to 12 hours before just getting ready to do the end. And so I can know as, as much about that person as anybody has. That's my commitment. Unfortunately, because Craig's schedule is so intense, I did. I got 10 minutes to do a pre-interview with him. Wow. So, I'm as excited and nervous as about as you are to hear what's going to come out this morning. Um, but again, from 10,000 people that Craig was with two days ago to our breakfast this morning, I am I'm truly humbled to be with you and grateful that you would make time to be with us this morning. And last thing before we start getting into some questions, if it's been said that you can tell a lot about a person by two things. 
their friends, and their critics. So with that in mind, we've got somebody that will, all of us, be walking away saying, I learned a tremendous amount this morning. So, Craig, with that as a background, um, to get things started, let's just talk a little bit about yourself in terms of what gets you excited, which is a lot of things, I know, but what are you passionate about? What gets you out of bed in the morning and moving throughout your day, which are long days and well, it was very different when I was 20 than at 71. <laughs> yeah, so the spectrum of things has changed. Quite As they a bit. say, that he who says he can do at 60 what he did at 30, didn't do much at 30. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were supposed to do twice as much at 60. So, uh, um, well, it, there's no two days that are alike, so that's probably good because I get bored easily. Uh, so I spend most of my time at Human Longevity, which is about two blocks uh, this way. Uh, it's a little over three years old, and we can talk about that more in detail, but uh, we're saving a few lives every day there by the new approaches we have to medicine, so that's, that makes it pretty exciting, and uh, we're trying to expand that uh, globally to make it more than a few lives a day. Um, but um, I like the San Diego environment because uh, it allows me to do everything from stand up paddle boarding to tennis to motorcycle and ATV riding in the desert. So yeah. You've been accused of being an adrenaline junkie. Uh, that, that sense to be supported by what you just said. Just yeah. yeah. It's, um, I, I do like to go fast. Um, I just got a ticket over in the East County. <laughs> <laughs> Those people in East County, they're tough. Uh, I was going 120 on my motorcycle, um, but the cop was very nice, and he put it uh, 65 in the 55 zone, Ooh. but noted that the radar said 120. <laughs> <laughs> in case I tried to dispute it. <clears throat> uh, Those malfunctioning machines. That's you know. right. But, uh, well, and, and you are doing some things that truly others are not. And it, it does happen because you and your team were the <coughs> first ones. To, you, as I understand it, you were in a race against the government to unpack and map the human genome. So, and yeah, let's start back there. About. Okay, so. Um, let me start a little bit earlier to put things in, in context. So after I got out of Vietnam, um, uh, my goal was to go to medical school. Um, I was actually, uh, had a tremendous medical experience in Vietnam. I probably did more medicine than most physicians do in their whole career. And my understanding, just to put this in, for those parents and grandparents out there that are a little nervous about your kids or grandkids about how they're doing, as I understand it, you were in the half of the academic section that made the upper half of the curve possible. Uh, shall, we, shall we say you weren't the best of students? I made the upper 90% possible. <laughs> okay. uh, I spent my time in high school building boats and doing anything but uh, uh, paying attention to school. So I barely graduated from high school. Uh, the only way I graduated, I got a D minus instead of an F in a government class um, by knowing that my government teacher was a Barry Goldwater fan, so that's a dating thing, so if you can go back that far, I can tell. Um, and so I wrote a final paper on why Barry Goldwater should be president, even though, even though that's the last thing I shot, thought should ever happen, but uh, uh, he was so impressed that I passed the class and graduated. So. Um, but I moved to Southern California to take up a surfing career. And, uh, and you were a swimmer too, as I recall. Yes. Like you got actually a scholarship, yeah. I think, to go to college. Yeah, you? I was offered a scholarship to go to uh, Arizona State and um, held an American record for a while. But um, I, I knew I was not ready for college, so um, I was more ready for fun and surfing. But. Uh, um, there was this thing going on that most of you haven't experienced it's called the draft. Uh, and I was literally drafted off my surfboard. Um, and long story short, I ended up a, as a corpsman in the Navy. Uh, and uh, I was stationed for a year and a half. 
staff at Balboa Hospital where I ran the infectious disease ward and learned about all the diseases that later we would do the genomes of. So there was an introduction to uh, infectious diseases. But as a 19-year-old, uh, I was running the largest ward there and um, teaching interns and residents how to do spinal taps and liver biopsies. And the nice thing about military medicine, depending on which side you're on, is uh, you, uh, you're, you know, there's no liability, so you can do as much as your skill set and people allow, allow you to do. So, um, and I, I was like a sponge learning this stuff very quickly. Um, and eventually I was transferred to the uh, field hospital in Da Nang. Uh, but it was a uh, medical education uh, of extreme intensity. Uh, it was the main receiving hospital for the whole i Corps area. And I was there for the Tet Offensive and literally had to learn how to do triage, uh, not as an academic exercise, but really deciding which people could be saved and which ones couldn't. Um, I was also a doctor for a small village and orphanage. Uh, I had a, a jeep, um, a Vietnamese nurse interpreter, a huge medical kit, and a 45. And you I was 21, 22? I turned time? 21 in Vietnam. Yeah. allowed to go into these areas because I was bringing in medicine. Uh, the Viet Cong would wait outside the clinic and then take the medicine away from uh, people. Mm. So I tried to get smarter. Instead of giving them antibiotic pills, I would only give injections uh, so they couldn't steal things. But they, they'd steal soap and stuff like that. But uh, you know, I, I changed from sort of being a surf bum to uh, wanting to go back to school. and. Uh, my plan was to get an MD and maybe practice third world medicine because it was such an uh, enjoyable thing, a uh, rewarding thing. And I, I just started a community college in the, uh, up in the Bay Area and then transferred to UCSD in uh, 1971. Um, and I got my bachelor's degree in 72, but I published my uh, first major paper as an undergraduate uh, because uh, one thing that was different from uh, other training, uh, UCSD has some of the best scientists in the world, so I was introduced to high-end science. And uh, I made a major discovery. Uh, I was given my own research lab as an undergraduate. And I enjoyed science so much that I switched uh, uh, from medicine to uh, doing basic science. And uh, I have never regretted the, the difference make a big discovery, it can affect uh, billions of people and, uh, versus trying to see 100 patients a day. Well, so. and, and that's truly where you are standing at the precipice now, is that with the science and the research that you're doing, again, not without controversy, yeah. um, you are poised to, in fact, impact potentially billions of lives. Yeah. Well, you can't, uh, you can't make progress in life without controversy. Uh, if everybody loves what you're doing all the time, wasting your time. You're not doing something that's worthwhile. Um, and uh, and so you, you, usually tell, you, you can tell the, the leaders and the scouts because those are the ones with the arrows in yeah, the back, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, when I was uh, at NIH, uh, a very senior person in the U.S. government uh, was visiting, going through the NIH and came to see me and he said, son, this is Washington, D.C. We judge the quality of people by the quality of their enemies. He said, son, you have some of the best. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and speaking of that, um, in terms of, of no, the, uh, let's talk about the genomic work that you got brought into. I know, again, yeah. you've, you've, got, you've got so much fascinating history, it's hard to even know where to stop, but. Well, that was the start of all of it, was at NIH, mm -hmm. and. Because um, you got frustrated, didn't you? You got impatient. One of, the, one of you've asked, "What is the criticism about you? You probably resemble the most, and that is impatience, yeah. and that's a great quality, frankly, for leaders." Yeah. Well, things move very slowly, even uh, in the field of science. Uh, probably 
10 times slower than they should, and we waste at least 90% of the money that uh, the billions that we have in government. Um, and I developed a method for dealing with gene discovery um, uh, that was about a thousand times faster than what the world was doing. And it became very controversial because I was making more discoveries a day than whole institutions like Harvard could make in a year. And, you know, instead of those people wanting to adopt the method, they, uh, they attacked me of, it, they, they said it was not fair that I was making so many discoveries and they had to work harder to make discoveries. And I, it's, it's amazing a Harvard professor would confess that because he says, I'm smarter than he is. And, um, uh, eventually, they did adopt the methods, but um, the Human Genome Project was supposed to be a 15-year, $3 billion program, and it was considered such a huge undertaking, the largest one ever in science, that they had to distribute uh, parts of the genome around the world. Uh, so between Britain and European countries, they added another $2 billion to it, so it's $5 billion. Um, and uh, by then I had started my own research institute. So um, I, based on the method I would discovered, I was getting lots of offers to start biotech companies. Um, you called yourself the accidental millionaire. Yes. Uh, so I had the top government salary, I had top science position. I think I was making 82,000 a year. <laughs> Uh, in, uh, uh, in 1990, and uh, I started getting offers. One offer was uh, they would give me a five million dollar uh, signing check if I'd come and be the CEO of their company. But I just didn't want to run a biotech company, and um, so there's this one venture capitalist who really wanted my technique. Uh, and I, asked, I said, well, the only way you'll get it is to fund starting a new not-for-profit research institute. Um, and I finally got a 10-year, uh, $70 million commitment out of them uh, to fund it. So I left NIH in 1992. Um, this is the 25th anniversary of uh, the Venture Institute, which I'm sure some of you have seen on the corner of Torrey Pines and North Torrey Pines. Um, As I understand, you have uh, you're you're bicoastal with your operations. Yeah, we're and still have nearly we still have scientists. Yeah, and, and we students. still have facilities in Rockville. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the lessons I learned early on, when you're given the complete freedom to do what you want, you can't do it uh, if you have any responsibility. So. Um, I could have put my institute anywhere in the country, uh, but my research team uh, uh, settled in with families and schools, uh, did not want to leave the D.C. area. So I had the choice of going by myself uh, or uh, accommodating what, uh, what my employees wanted. So uh, freedom's an illusion to do what you want. Uh, like the first of many smart moves. Yeah. Uh, so we still have facilities there, but uh, in 2006 we moved uh, back to La Jolla and uh, um, the university gave us a very nice piece of land um, uh, just above the aquarium and that's, uh, we built the world's first carbon neutral research building. So uh, the roof is a, a half a megawatt power plant. And, uh, generates all its own energy and has lots of other very cool innovations in it. But, uh, well, and speaking of innovations, one of the things I love about the fact that you have you unmapped uh, or you mapped the human genome is it's giving you the ability to do some very creative things such as um, identifying for a normal healthy male they might or female, they might walk in and yet you're finding, if I recall, 2% uh, are having cancer. 23% are uh, have a proclivity for heart or circulatory disease. Like you're able to anticipate and look ahead because of the work that you've done. 
So, looking at the rough age <coughs> of this room, if you're between 50 and 74, 40% uh, of the males in this room will never see the age of 74. Wow. And 28% of the women won't ever see the age of 74. Two thirds of the reasons are cancer and heart disease. So that's sort of a starting point where we are. Um, everybody thinks they're gonna live to be 80 or 90. 40% um, of males, 74 is a target that's not reached. Hmm. So um, with HLI, we decided that if we switch things to predictive medicine, trying to predict from the genome, uh, early detection, uh, preventative measures, that just with cancer and heart disease, we could change the outcome and greatly extend the lives of a large number of people. Um, and also our goal was to interpret the human genome. So in 2000, when we uh, sequenced the first version, that gave a lot of information, told us how many genes we had, um, Which, by the way, um, he beat the government. So with the $5 billion of investments, yeah. he came in, and nine months later, of course, with a wonderful team, beat them. Now, I think President Clinton had to say politically, the politically correct thing at that point was say it was a tie. But the reality was most people have said that you, you beat the government in a very short period of time. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, they weren't even <coughs> close. Uh, one, <laughs> one, one of the leaders of the team published uh, in his biography that the White House event where we announced that that their team, the government team, was a bunch of frauds and liars because they weren't anywhere near finished. Uh, but they had to say they were because we were finished. And um, um, some of those guys are sore losers. They're still. Uh, <laughs> Still upset today, but um, you know, people set up programs, uh, you know, with multi-billion dollars, and they thought they were going to ride this gravy train for 15 years, and a lot of them were going to retire working on the human genome, and uh, I just helped them into early retirement. <laughs> uh, uh, but. Uh, we're just at the verge of starting to understand it, so we uh, we need large numbers of genomes. So we're setting up to uh, sequence millions of genomes. So we're Illumina is just across uh, the way here. We're their largest customer. Um, uh, we sequence genomes roughly one every 12 minutes now, 24 hours a day. Uh, instead of one every nine months for 100 million dollars, we're under $1,000 per genome. Uh, so we're building a large database that's helping to us to understand it. But uh, the genome on its own is not very useful at this stage. So uh, I built a testing facility that we now call the Health Nucleus to measure as much as we could on uh, each individual that we're doing the genome of. So we would have all their phenotypes uh, and we only wanted healthy people to come in uh, to go through uh, this process at the beginning. And we found from basically day one, one of the first clients uh, was a physician uh, that we discovered a five centimeter tumor under his breastbone that he didn't know he had. Uh, and from then on, it switched from uh, just doing phenotyping to a major uh, discovery program where 40% of healthy people that come in uh, have something major wrong with them. And they have no idea of this when they're coming in. They think they're perfectly healthy because the definition of health is you look okay, you feel okay, therefore the medical system deems that you're healthy. If you have symptoms, then you go see somebody to try and deal with your symptoms. So these are people that are symptom free, and uh, so 5% of people we see over the age of 50 have a major tumor that they're unaware of, uh, one that would eventually kill them. Uh, but because we're finding
finding them before, thus far, every one has been found before they've metastasized. So we find them at stage zero, stage one, uh, and stage two. Uh, the diagnoses have all been 100% accurate with the new MRI technique we have. And everybody has been uh, treated and cancer free. Uh, so the statistics are very different if you were one of the million and a half people diagnosed with cancer each year, you're diagnosed generally because you have symptoms. Uh, those symptoms are usually because your tumor has metastasized and it's affecting, uh, causes bone pain or causes some problem in some tissue. <coughs> so at that stage, uh, you're already greatly compromised and your chance of living a full life uh, so early detection, um, you know, it, it's just such a different level of satisfaction because, uh, as I said, everybody that we've uh, uh, seen, uh, they are now cancer-free, including myself. So um, <coughs> I, I've had an elevated uh, PSA for years at biopsies at UCSD told I was cancer free. Uh, I went through our new MRI system to test it. I was told by a radiologist that I had a high grade tumor, uh, that I better have surgery right away. And um, had I waited three months, it would have metastasized. So it was right on the verge of working its way out. So uh, I had surgery last December. So my own clinic saved my own life. And, uh, we had all the senior people from my uh, the Venture Institute go through, and Hamilton Smith, the Nobel laureate, uh, was one of the uh, people who went through at 82. Uh, we found a fist-sized tumor in his lung wow. uh, that he was unaware that he had. It was a very fast-growing lymphoma. Uh, we started treating it immediately. He's now his hair's all grown back. He's back in the lab every day, cancer-free. Uh, had we not detected it, it was growing so fast, he would have been dead in six weeks. Well, Craig, we had Peter Farrell, uh, as you know. Uh, Peter Farrell he's is an investor. He is an investor in the company. Peter Farrell, we had, and he's the founder of ResMed, so if you are um, have sleep apnea, which many men, and actually a surprising number of women also struggle with being having sleep deprivation because of, of breathing. Uh, as a result of having Peter with us, a number of folks in our audience went out and got a breathing test done, and I had more than a few people come back and say to me, you know what, I think you saved, or Peter saved my life uh, because of getting this test done. If I you have, snore, you have sleep apnea. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and I'm hearing you, um, you know, part of what this is about, and, and we've got, as I knew we would, we're running out of time, and you've got so much fascinating information. But for this morning, when people are hearing this, where do they go? How do they follow through? Do they go to your clinic? Uh, is that the next step for them? Because there are some folks in here that, clearly with a group this big, there's some folks in here that you just described that they didn't know it, yeah. but you just described them. Well, everybody in this room should go through the clinic. If you're smart, that's you know, what we enable people to do is take control of their own lives. Instead of sitting around waiting for something to happen, uh, you're doing preventative maintenance. Most people do preventive maintenance on their cars. You don't wait till the engine freezes uh, uh, and you can't drive it before you change the oil. Some people do, but it's, uh, it's not a recommended practice. But most people don't do preventative maintenance on themselves. Um, People think that diet and exercise, they use those as surrogates for not knowing their true health. So you have to guess what your health is if, uh, because you can't see inside of you. Uh, we have non-invasive techniques uh, that you know, can change that equation. So lots of uh, uh, major athletes die from sudden heart attacks the epitome of health. I remember Jim uh, Fix, the runner, yeah. uh, who lived longer than his father and brothers, but still dies very early. Uh, 
I argue you can eat all the kale you want, <laughs> <laughs> but if you have a brain aneurysm or you have a tumor, it's not going to change your life. So it's really important to know what your status really is. So Craig, how would, where would people go? What's the website? Um, how do people go it's, to find that information and then get, be able to get paid? It's humanlongevity.com, or you can talk to Jill. That's why she came today. Uh, we have programs ranging from $25,000 to right now $2,500. Um, that um, the two and a half thousand dollar one is an entry level one that does the complete genome and the complete suite of things we do with the MRI. And uh, just from the MRI, so we don't use contrast uh, media uh, like hospitals do, uh, we developed an algorithm uh, that uh, does uh, far better than contrast media. Um, it measures the water differences <coughs> in different tissues. So it can detect tumors. Tumors light up like a light bulb. Uh, your vascular system lights up uh, very clearly. And so 1% of pe people, so there's roughly 100 people here, statistically one of you has a brain aneurysm. Uh, one in 50 in the US have aneurysms somewhere in their bodies. They're usually discovered, particularly brain aneurysms, when they pop and people have sudden massive strokes uh, and die. Uh, it's not a very good diagnostic method. Um, yeah. Now it's just part of the uh, standard MRI exam and uh, brain aneurysms don't require brain surgery anymore. They're treated as an outpatient uh, with interventional radiology, uh, just putting a tube up through your blood vessels and putting a coil in the aneurysm prevent your own sudden death uh, uh, just with a very, very simple procedure. 5% of people over 50 were discovering cancer. 23% uh, have fatty livers. So no matter what physical you have, I'm sure you've not had your organ fat measured. It's one of the most important parameters for understanding your future health. Uh, my belt is pretty much my measurement of that fatty tissue, but yeah. Yeah, but yeah, that uh, that measures your peripheral fat, not your organ fat. Right. Uh, so you can be thin like you are, and you can have a lot of fat in your liver. Um, and that's roughly the case with 23% uh, of people. Many of those go on to progress uh, to cirrhosis. Uh, the highest percentage we've seen thus far is 38%. Normal is 4%. Um, and uh, fortunately it changes dynamically if you make dynamic changes in your life. Um, I was on halfway through a 30 mile bike ride with the world's expert on organ fat. Uh, we stopped for a break after 15 miles and he said, by the way, exercise uh, won't decrease your organ fat. And I said, why didn't you tell me 15 miles earlier? <laughs> Uh, so calorie restriction is the only thing that will reverse organ fat, um, but it's dynamic. Um, so because the technique is not invasive, you can get checked as often as uh, you want or can afford to. Um, mine was initially 4% uh, after uh, two months of holiday partying that went up to 7%. Uh, and then worked its way back down uh, uh, again with dieting. But um, uh, we also do, uh, in the comprehensive program, measure about 20,000 chemicals in the blood. Uh, we can predict if you're pre-diabetic, pre so we can predict your future slide into diabetes <coughs> before any clinic can. And, but we look at the whole person, so if you have insulin sensitivity, if you have high organ fat, uh, if you have a pear-shaped fat distribution, uh, and usually those same people have some sort of increased cholesterol, uh, their path in life, they have two choices. Uh, they can sort of do nothing, uh, eat uh, excessively, uh, like most Americans, uh, that person will develop 
develop diabetes, they'll develop cardiac complications to the diabetes. The cardiac complications will lead to early dementia, uh, and they'll be one of the people that die before they reach 74. Or they can uh, yeah. totally Don't invite Craig to your party at New Year's Eve. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, yeah. Or they can take control of their lives, like uh, so. You, you know, you, you had you said you had Jesse Knight in here as a speaker. He's somebody that, after going through, uh, totally turned his life around, and uh, uh, his measurements are now all fantastically normal. And, uh, I'd be out to dinner with he and Joy, so honey, remind me wherever my wife is. So might, we'll talk with Jesse and see how he's doing on that. And, yeah. and, uh, uh, so, uh, Craig, know, it, it's information to give you control of your life. And if you're one of the 5% that has cancer now, you can get rid of that and save your life. That's what I love about what you're doing, is because you're putting control back, at least to some degree, in the hands of the individuals, <coughs> as opposed to them being a helpless victim of their genetic code. Well, most men are, are concerned about prostate cancer. There's two kinds of prostate cancer. There's the kind you die with and the kind you die from. So our MRI technique only detects the kind that you die from. It doesn't detect high-grade prostate cancer. Uh, roughly 5% of men that go through, we find that they have high-grade prostate cancer. Over half of those have no symptoms and they have normal PSA. So they would have mm. no hint whatsoever. Mm. Uh, within six months to a year, it would have turned into metastatic cancer. The five-year survival rate is 28%. So just by coming through, getting it detected, they're definitely saving their own lives. And uh, uh, But if you just sit there and eat kale, that's not going to stop. Uh, uh, metastases of this tumor that you don't know that you have. Um, so a lot of cardiovascular disease, um, but <coughs> everything that we find for the most part is actionable, uh, including we can predict when you're likely to have uh, dementia if you're going to get it. We can tell you whether it's in three months or in 20 years. that as well. So um, you can go online and sign up. Uh, Jill can give you information. There's a special right now of this $2,500 introductory thing that won't last very long. So uh, if you want to do it, uh, the, the MRI gives all this data, including the metabolic data, the vascular data. Uh, the new MRI gives a cardiac report. Uh, it's pretty stunning. It gives you quantitative uh, evaluation of your brain. Um, so the new techniques are really fantastic. And we couple the data with the genome to try and make the genome more interpretable. So everybody that goes through is contributing to the database to help make better discoveries for the next person. Well, and I know many of you are gonna, this is just prompting questions. I can see people taking notes like crazy. Remember, we do have our deeper dive at 9.15 to 10, so um, we're going to break here momentarily. We've got, um, which I hate to do, but we've, we've got to get to our table facilitators to be able to, to follow things. So we've got another five or 10 minutes or so, but um, for those that, that can stay from 9.15 to 10, we're gonna to adjourn to that back room and have, we'll have questions and Q&A &A time. Great, um, if we were meeting three years from today, so I guess November 15th of 2020, and it sounds so far away, but it will be here like that. What has to, absolutely has to happen for you to feel like those three years have been exciting and rewarding and meaningful and, and, and fun too? What's that look like? So we're starting, uh, because these clinics are becoming a very popular idea, we're starting to franchise them. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're hoping that we can have 10 or so open in the next year. Um, we'd like to have 300 or so because that would really feed massive data into the database. Um, but if 3,000 people a year go through a single clinic uh, and we have 10 of those clinics, that's 30,000 people. 5% of them alone are going to have major cancer discovered in their life, say from that 1%. Um, 
not going to have aneurysms. Um, the cardiovascular diagnosis, we do cardiac CT scanning. Uh, and, and by the way, cardiac calcium is starting to show up in younger and younger populations, particularly women. So heart disease has now moved into first place as the number one killer of women over cancer, even though most women, most men, uh, most physicians don't consider heart disease a woman's disease. Uh, so it's now up there with men as the number one killer. Um, and we see this uh, 45 year old woman that's uh, not obese, had major calcium in all four coronary arteries. The prediction is that before she's 55, she would have a major heart attack if nothing's changed. So you got uh, her attention. We, we got her attention, and, and she's doing something about it. So, um, so we we hope this expands. The medical community is not, in general, happy with this uh, because prevention means that you're not going to see them with your symptoms to try and sort things out. Um, the cost of treating a tumor, a prostate cancer, we see a lot of uh, renal cancer. Uh, renal cancer is now just treated uh, with a small tube and the ablation of the tumor. Um, if you have metastatic cancer, you get treated for months, if not years. So it changes the cost of medicine just to treat something and get rid of it. Um, even the head of concierge medicine at UCSD, who used to be uh, my personal uh, doctor, refused to send people to the health nucleus because he thought it was wrong to do tests on healthy people. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, how do you know they're healthy? They used to be standard, obviously. And uh, I said, I can tell you whether you're healthy. You can't tell me you're healthy. He slowly come around and he's now referring people, but um, um, a, a lot of uh, Hollywood actors and famous people have been through, so if you pick the right day, you might have good company. <laughs> <laughs> Great, obviously you are, you're impacting in your team in, in ways that are big and small. How, how would you like to be remembered? You know, please God, you're a dynamic 71 year old and you know, another 30, 40, 50 years from now, terrific. I've set my thermostat for 147. I want to see new century come in. That's why you and I are going to be great friends because I got to go by the clinic. But, you know, how do you want to be remembered? So, uh, being the first to sequence the human genome is a historic event um, that will be impacting societies for the rest of human existence. So, um, I'm likely to be remembered for that, you know, 500 years from now. Um, but that was just the beginning step, you know, so I'd really like to be remembered for driving it to change the complete practice of medicine from reactive to proactive. Uh, and <coughs> using your information, that's uh, your genetic software codes for all these things. Uh, I hope in three years we'll be able to make far better predictions just straight from the genome because of all the data from all the people going through um, and that that will keep uh, getting better. Right, right now we can predict your face uh, to an actual picture of you, uh, your height, your weight, your BMI, eye color, your hair color, your blood type, your HLA type. Uh, I don't know if any of you watched the Chelsea Handler show or even know what that is. So <clears throat> she wanted her, she's a comedian, she has a show that's now on Netflix. Uh, she wanted her genome sequenced and she wanted to get her report live on television. Um, so I said, well, your genome predicts your, you will be 160 pounds. It goes, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like Chelsea Hammond. <laughs> I said, well, some of us 
don't quite achieve our genome potential, so now that it's greatly exceeded. That so. may be why her Netflix show ended after two seasons. Uh, but, so, Craig, what's, what's some of the best advice, uh, wisdom, that you've had shared with you or that, that you would pass along to others, like your team, your, your family, yeah. and such? Well, the only really good advice I got was uh, from my mentor here at UCSD, the late Nate Kaplan, um, who said that most people talk themselves out of doing the experiment, which is why uh, science is moving so slowly. If you're afraid of the results, you're afraid your experiment might, some people are afraid of success, some people are afraid their experiment might work. You know, th this is an experiment you guys can all do and go find out something about your health. And a lot of people are afraid to find out about their health they'll talk themselves out of it. Well, I really don't want to know. But I don't think people really want just to get a random disease and die prematurely uh, from that when it could be avoided. Um, you're, you're used to going to a physician because you have symptoms and you get diagnosed with a disease. And that's, you know, that's not great news. It was not great <coughs> news to learn that I had high-grade prostate cancer except that I knew that it was 100% treatable. Um, if I was told at the same time that it had high-grade prostate cancer had already metastasized, that wouldn't have been great news. But um, if you get the information early enough, you have control of your own life. So each of you can decide whether to do that experiment or you can rely on kale and exercise. You're reminding me of a physician that, that uh, I was working with that uh, didn't want, he took his investment statements and took them home and threw them in his desk drawer and closed the desk drawer. And I said, well, Joe, why shouldn't we, let, let's take a look at that to see how you're doing and, and, and how your investments are doing. He said, I'm afraid I'm not making very much money. But wouldn't you <laughs> want to know the fact that you're not making much money? It's like the fact is, I want to lose weight. Well, how much do you weigh? I'm not sure because I don't want to step on the scale, you know? So, great. Um, you're a fascinating guy. You're, we, we barely scratched the surface of what you're doing. Um, thank you for what you and your team are willing to bring. There's so much more, that, as I said, that we didn't get into, but that $2,500, my goodness, that's not a cost, that's an investment. Yep. The that's an investment. The people who paid 25000 and found how to live longer have all considered a great investment. Great investment, <laughs> yeah. It doesn't get any better than yeah. that kind of return. So um, we, sadly, uh, have to break it here, but you um, now have some wonderful table facilitators, Alan and Timmy and Terry, and where are some of our other table facilitators? Um, we'll go ahead and we've got another great one over here. So uh, we're gonna take a break now and uh, talk about, at your table, what, are, what did you hear this morning from, from Craig? How are you gonna apply this in your business? How are you gonna apply this in your family, in your community? Um, what are you, and, and again, we're all leaving a legacy. I hope everybody gets to stay for the Q&A part, but if you do need to slip out, ask yourself, what's the legacy that you're gonna live and leave behind? Maybe I'll throw out one thing. Most businesses in the U.S. are self-insured. Um, so you should ask, it's the right thing for you to do and is it the right thing for your company to do is to try and save the lives of your employees. Uh, that's why uh, all the uh, senior people at the, the Venture Institute, we paid for them to go through. Uh, and it paid off in terms of uh, uh, two of them uh, were found to have cancer their lives saved, so that, that's, that's, that's a pretty good uh, return on investment um, versus health insurance companies don't care how long you live. In fact, the sooner you die, the more money you save them. Um, and uh, so not only can individuals take charge of their lives, your corporations can take charge as well. Great comment, great comment. It, it's not about just simply how long you live, but it's the quality of life that you live. And 
that's what you're doing. Is your quality of life you want for your employees. Yep, exactly. So again, thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to invite you to go ahead and uh, turn to your table of facilitators, have conversations, ask yourselves, what are you walking away with? What did you hear today? How can you take what you've learned and use that and apply that in your own life? And again, we're all leaving a legacy. So, um, and then we'll be, Phil will be bringing this back in a, a few minutes before nine. We do have a drawing. We've got some wonderful gifts to send you out with. And then again, we've got our Q&A time. So, dive in. But first of all, thank you.